Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for another webinar from the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us tonight. Our guest tonight is Dr. Bob Rosenwasser from J uh, Thomas Jefferson Department of Neurosurgery. He is truly a master surgeon who has helped many, many aneurysm surgeons in his career, and we're truly honored to have him with us tonight to discuss his perspectives regarding unruptured aneurysms. Bob, thanks again, and please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, with everyone, wherever you may be. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Aaron and Christine and the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. Um, I'm going to go through some information fairly quickly because I want to make sure that we leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay. So I think one thing that we all face, both as physicians and patients, is the issue of the unruptured aneurysm. And that's still a significant amount of debate. This is older data, and it's 1990, 1987 dollars. But you could translate that into dollars in 2014 and 2015. Uh, this was published in, in, uh, by Dave Weber's from Mayo Clinic, who was at Mayo Clinic at the time. And look at the difference in cost to society, whether an aneurysm is treated prior to rupture or after rupture. In 1987 dollars, for the annual cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage in this country, it was $1.7 billion, compared to caring for an unruptured aneurysm population was $522 million. So you can imagine what the numbers are today. Intuitively obvious, you go in with a non-ruptured aneurysm, you're not sick, you get taken care of, and statistically, you're going to do very well. It's really the secondary injuries of subarachnoid hemorrhage that are problematic. There have been a lot of studies looking at length of stay and hospital cost and, and prophylactically repairing the aneurysm, assuming the morbidity and the risk uh, is low. Uh, intuitively, grade zero patients had significantly shorter lengths of stay and reduced morbidity, and that makes a lot of sense. And then, then the question comes up is to screen or not to screen. Family members, patients are often uh, inquiring about this, as well as other physicians. And I get this is probably the most, the most often question I get from primary care. And uh, the referrals really have changed. Most of our patients actually in the office, unruptured aneurysms do come from primary care uh, from their office directly. We know that there are certain genetic syndromes that clearly should be screened for aneurysm formation. Type 4 Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, coarctation of the aorta are some of the conditions that are related to that. The FIA syndrome, familial incidence of aneurysm syndrome, has been fairly well worked out. It's a cohort in which two first through third degree relatives have proven aneurysms, and generally they present at a younger age with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they also have a higher incidence of multiple lesions. So this is a, a family syndrome. Uh, it's an important to take a family tree and get some sense of family history when taking care of uh, aneurysm patients. Well, we know that family history dramatically increases the risk of hemorrhage. So if you have had a first order or second order relative who have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, screening is definitely appropriate. But I will tell you that it, we have to deal with the insurance companies, we speak with the medical directors, we give them the data, and invariably they do get approved for screening. So you should not, you should definitely push back if you have pushback from your insurance carrier regarding this. Very, very important piece of information. And again, the familial outcomes in subarachnoid hemorrhage, well, we know that a ruptured aneurysm, again, another piece of data, and here you can see the references, uh, occurs between three and sevenfold more frequently in first degree versus second degree relatives. So very, very important to screen that patient population. Interesting with patients with prior subarachnoid hemorrhage in terms of following those patients, just a bit of data, and you can see the references, and I think that these references probably can make be made available to you through the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. But clearly, if you're less than 40 and present with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you do have a chance of new aneurysm formation. And our practice has really been following those patients every five years, at least until they're age 40 at a minimum. Uh, the natural history of unruptured aneurysms, a lot of discussion about that. And Huvuela uh, actually studied these patients for a 30-year period. And, and really, the annual incidence of rupture was about 1.4 to 2% per year. Uh, again, this was a study that could never be done today. 